Prva gostja je Bronwyn Thornton, je mednarodna strokovnjakinja na področju Hoje in direktorica organizacije WOK 21, oziroma WOK 21. Zavzima se za promocijo Hoje, pri čemer sodeluje skupnost men strokovnjaki po vsem svetu. Njeno delo med drugim vključuje razvoj in izvajanje inovativnih praktičnih projektov ter orodijo podporo Hoje kot načinu mobilnosti. Da se privadimo in da bo vedela, da govorimo o njej, čeprav svoje ime je že slišala, bom to zdaj še prevedel. Bronwyn je CEO of WOK21, the global network leading in walking movement. She works with communities and professionals around the world to promote walking. And you will not believe this, but Bronwyn Thornton has a now not so secret passion for motorcycles. Bronwyn, good morning. Hello. Motorcycles. How come and how long? Um, all my adult life, I have loved motorcycles. And I share this secret for the first time with you because I think it illustrates that life is complex and we are multi-dimensional people. And uh, it just, when you live in Australia, I grew up in Australia, it's a beautiful place to ride a motorcycle because we have good weather and we have good roads and you have a sense of freedom like you get when you are walking or when you are cycling and you are connected with the environment. So, okay. And it is a secret because, of course, everyone thinks I should walk everywhere, which, of course, <laughs> is possible. So. Well, as long as this doesn't change your topic, you're... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's Go ahead, please. Please okay. uh, share your screen with us and we're looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation to uh, join you today, particularly to Luca. Um, we talked about this in Rotterdam long before COVID was even an imagination in, in our lives. I'm sure the uh, epidemiologists and the pandemic scientists knew it was coming, but we certainly, we certainly didn't. So. In, uh, in preparing for today and to talk to you about pathways to walkable cities and the work we're doing here in Walk 21, I thought back, when was I last in Ljubljana? And it was exactly 10 years ago in 2011, which was a bit of a shock. Um, it always is when the years rake up and, and, uh, and I thought about this and I, I was really quite taken aback because we had this whole day workshop and the audits and I did truly enjoy being there. And then last year, I came back very briefly. I don't call it visiting Ljubljana because I literally arrived, went to a hotel, had a Congress about e-mobility and scooters and left again. But in the short time I was there moving around on the streets between the hotel and the, and the conference and the airport, there was something I really noticed that has changed in the last 10 years. Ronald, well, just one thing, uh, yes. you're, you're, this is not full screen. Can you uh, maybe change that? Uh, I can try, but when we did the practice yesterday, it wasn't so easy. Okay, so never mind, just go ahead. I'm sorry about this. If you're aware of that, that is okay. I think after our experience yesterday, it is better not to try. Okay, I, go ahead. Please forget yeah. me uh, intervening. No, no, that's okay, because now my slides are not moving. So let me just see if I can. We had this problem yesterday, and then it just started to work. So... Uh, let me try full screen helps better. Hey, there we go. It's working today. Oh, okay, fantastic. Congrats. Thank you for interrupting. That's great. You're welcome. Better like this. This is what I noticed was so different. It was bicycles. There were so many more bicycles in Ljubljana. And I know that you are trying to host Velo City. Um, you, it was a victim of the pandemic. I was coming last year to be part of the Velo City conference and, uh, and I missed out. Um, but they, that was a really fundamental difference. I really noticed the energy of people on two wheels, not just here in this lovely little part of, of town, but out on the arterial streets where I was actually, you know, staying and, and catching a bus and, and things like that. And what I, I mean, I must confess, I'm disappointed to see them on a pedestrian crossing in pedestrian facilities and on a pedestrian zone, but we have to work out how we share the space and we have to recognize that this is a paradigm shift that's happened. The presence of bicycles in your city shows that your city is moving and shifting and so things are possible, things can uh, change. But when I was there 10 years ago, of course, this is where everybody uh, thinks of and understands when as a tourist, you come to Ljubljana, this is an iconic, 
um, space, the beautiful old town and the triple uh, bridges. And this brings me to my, um, my first poll, because I was actually quite uh, taken aback when I learned in 2011 what happened here in 2007. And so I want to ask the audience, and some of you will remember this, but do you remember when these bridges carried traffic? We see them now as beautiful pedestrian space, but do you remember when they carried traffic? I don't know how long this we give for this, but hopefully we get a result fairly quickly. You'll say yes. Yeah, I think we have. We could close the poll. I think it's yes or no, pretty easy. Yeah, exactly. Can I we kept see the, the results. Poll? Yeah. I'm not sure whether we can see the results. Yeah, hundred oh. percent say yes. Great. Okay, so you're not uh, you're not all as young as I hoped because when I it uh, when these. Uh, let me see. Now I'm not. My slide isn't changing. Oh dear. Can you press OK? There's a window. The document. There's a notification. Can you press OK? Let me see. I can't see this. No. Nope. Where is it on the screen? Is it? It's just right above the bridges. <laughs> the word oh, you bridges. Have bridges. You have the picture of the bridges. No, uh, the word bridges. Oh, I see. No, this is not on my screen. Um, Do you have screen. two screens, maybe? No, because I'm not in the office. All right, just one second. OK, for some reason, it is really not happy. It went so well yesterday. Maybe we've moved to the second poll because we can do that. So my question, I was really, I'm glad 100% you recognize that the bridges can, uh, when they carried traffic, because I was so shocked when I learned that that had been the case. And what was so interesting when I learned this was that when the traffic was first taken out, people still walked on the sides. They didn't know how to occupy the space in the middle. Ah, great. Now I can see the poll results. Yes. So 81, 19. So 81% remembers the old okay. times. Now, and do I have to young. close this or do you close this? Uh, it's on each screen. So you can, if you close it, it will only affect your screen. Okay. I can't close it. Oh. Okay, we'll work it out. It's fine. Um, so my you can see your next slide. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So my next question is: When we think about that space with the with the bridges, because I was so surprised to learn that um, it it didn't have it had had traffic and people took a while to occupy it. My next question is: Can you imagine putting the traffic back? Can you imagine traffic in this space now? Now that we have experienced it as pedestrian space. This is another poll. Uh, we're waiting yeah. for it to be activated. I see. Um, maybe you can just write your answer in the in the chat. Is the poll not working? Well, Brannon, I'm pretty sure that no one can imagine that now. So let's but you never take know. that for, yeah. I think let's yeah. take that as a yes then, because yeah. the, the reason for asking these questions, and now I have to hope for my slides to move. There we go. My reason for asking these questions is because this shows that what we can't imagine before 2007, we can't imagine going back to once we make these significant changes. And London's got a great example of this. Trafalgar Square used to be surrounded by traffic and they joined it to the National Gallery. They took the traffic out, created a proper plaza. And when they went back to measure the results of that, people couldn't remember what it was like before. So we can make these changes in our city. It might feel overwhelming, but it is possible to create these, these shifts. But a thing that I want to be really careful about is it's easy to imagine this space with, for only pedestrians because it's the heart of the old town. There's lots of cafes, there's beautiful river and buildings and a lot of people come. 
to be here. And people will say to you, oh, but it can't be like that everywhere. And of course it can't be like this everywhere. But the principle of valuing walking and allocating the right amount of space for people to walk and creating the right environment so that it's nice to walk can happen everywhere. And it then is a balance between different modes and different demands on the space, but the valuing and the quality and the priority for walking remains the same. In this space, it's appropriate to give pedestrians all of the space, but in other places, we take that same ideas and translate it into nice walkability. So my last poll, and this is answering into the chat, so please put your answers into the chat. I want you to write down up to three words about how you would describe the experience of being in the space that we've just looked at in those triple bridges. If you can do it in English, then I can possibly read them, but I can't read them while I'm sharing my screen because of the issue I'm having, but I can look at them afterwards. And maybe, um, you know, I mean, it's pretty, if you can capture some of those words and we can come back to it and I'll keep going for now. So this brings me to the question, which is, what is a walkable city? Because it can't all be beautiful downtown Ljubljana. It can't all be pedestrian only spaces. Is it where people just, a lot of people walk all the time? And we know from our work globally that there are a lot of cities where the volumes of people walking are very high, but the conditions are very poor. Now, this is a picture uh, from the Philippines when they had a bus strike. And so people are still having to go to work. And so they are walking into work. This is peak traffic flow of pedestrians into town for working, for working in the mornings. And then there'll probably be the similar flow leaving in the afternoon. Now, when you look at this picture, that's a lot of people walking, but there are still cars parked on footpaths and there is still very poor conditions. If it wasn't this peak flow because of a bus strike, you can see the condition of the footpaths and the lack of quality. So, People walking is not the only indication of a walkable city. And it's really critical because in cities where we work across Africa and in, even in London where people walk, they walk a lot only because they have to, not because it's, it's something that they particularly enjoy. And enjoyment is a critical part of, of walkable cities. So I wanna talk about three elements, not just about the conditions on the ground, which is critical, but to truly create a walkable city requires commitment at the authority level. It requires the right urban fabric in which it to happen. And it requires qu that quality on the ground when you actually get out and enjoy the walking experience. And this is really important because if we don't have committed authorities that invest and prioritize walking and conditions for walking, it doesn't translate into land use planning patterns that create accessible neighborhoods. And it doesn't translate into investment, which creates really high quality um, conditions on the ground in which the people people walk. And I'm gonna talk more about committed authorities later because I think this is really, um, a, a program that we run to embed the changes that need to happen so that it's not the whim of a different political color. It is just a fundamental way that we manage our cities. But first, let's just remind ourselves of the benefits of walking. I don't have to sell walking as hard as I did when I first came into this job 15 years ago. Finally, the world knows how great it is. We all experienced last year the change in our communities, and I will talk more about that. But the evidence is so in, the understanding is there now. I don't get the same blank looks when I say to people, I talk about walking, and they say, oh, are you going to teach us to breathe next? You know, like people understand the importance of it, but there's a couple of really critical things that I want to mention in the context of the right now, right now in uh, 2021. First of all, physical inactivity, non-communicable diseases, our lifestyle choices are killing us. More people die from lack of activity than die in road safety crashes, like millions more. So we must do something. And the World Health Organization, we're working closely with them to promote more active lifestyles. The other significant thing that happened um, right at the beginning of last year, it was almost the last thing I did before we went into lockdown, was in Stockholm, they had the third global ministerial for road safety. And the Stockholm Declaration recognizes that mode shift encouraging people to walk and cycle by creating safe, accessible conditions for them to do so is actually a road safety um, action. So historically, 
people wanted to protect you, you were vulnerable, like remove you from risk, all those sorts of things. We still want to protect you, but we want to do it by building safe systems. And by shifting people into walking and cycling is not only makes it better for the people walking and cycling, it makes it better for everybody. It makes a safer street system. So we now have followed up from that meeting with the UN resolution for a second decade of road safety. One of the recommendations for action during this decade is investment in good walking and cycling infrastructure. And that means high quality pavements, crossings, speed management and traffic management. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And finally, it's so cost effective. We have to invest in walkability because it underpins the economic vibrancy of our communities and the economic viability of our transport systems. We don't have a transport system. This is not about the co-benefits. Transport experts will tell you, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'm not a health professional. I'm not here to deliver health. It's not in my KPIs. No, it's not but delivering a financially viable transport system is, getting ridership on public transport is, and walkable catchments, investing in those catchments is how we can do it. So let's look at some of the great cities that are doing interesting things and worthwhile things for, for walking around the world. And I'm starting with Hong Kong for two very important reasons. When you do those charts about mode share and density and what, where the most people are walking, Hong Kong's way out on a limb out here. Like 90% of people walk every day. They don't walk very far, but they do walk and connect with public transport to extend their journeys. But they also walk a lot in their everyday lives because they have high density living, they have high density public transport, they have proximity to, to local services. And so the, those environmental factors that make the good walkability. Can we just get the microphone? Somebody? I'm not sure who it is, but it's quite loud. Um, thank you. Someone should turn off their microphone. Yeah, thanks. It's just really echoey, echoey here. Anyway, what's interesting in Hong Kong and everyone would think, oh, well, 90%, what's the problem? Nothing, nothing. Actually, there's a lot of places it's not nice to walk in Hong Kong and people, again, don't choose to do it for leisure or for health and they don't like to do it. There's no quality in the experience. And we've been working with them for the last three years, developing up strategic plans and street designs and, and things to make Hong Kong a better walkable city, not just a city where people walk all the time. So high volumes of walking is usually associated with Africa and poorer communities, but these wealthy big Asian cities, they need walking to survive as well. Mentioned briefly Dublin, um, and I'm going to come back to Dublin at the end of my presentation, but they're planning a 100% increase in walking. They're investing and they've got a national investment of 20% of their transport budget to active travel following the last election. That's a million euros a day for encouraging walking. Woohoo! We've got so many great ideas and they're so willing to actually give it a go. It's really exciting that when you get that attention and that priority and that investment, let's see, let's keep a watch on that and uh, see how, how Ireland and Dublin get on. Finally, Rotterdam, Netherlands, of course, famous for cycling, lovely for cycling, not so lovely for walking because there's so many bicycles everywhere all over. And Amsterdam is famous for not being comfortable to walk around now because of the bicycles. But again, looking at that and see, realizing in Rotterdam that they created lots of public spaces for people to come and enjoy the city, but they were losing people in the, in the commute and in the travel. And we've been working with them on, on walking and the Netherlands as well, doing a national strategy. Oslo, you probably know about Oslo, famous for Vision Zero, no pedestrian fatalities in 2019, because since committing in 2002, they have invested in walking and traffic management and they've got success. It is possible. These are not pipe dreams. It is possible with, with uh, consistent and applied attention to um, investment in these areas. Seoul, which actually we were meant to be there last year for our conference where we're going to have an online event this year hosted by the city of Seoul. They started at the road safety agenda. That was the problem that they sought to address by investing in walking. But now they've converted that into an ambitious plan for greenways and riverside parks. They've got the very famous um, daylighted river where they took away a freeway. And that has inspired them that these some of these big ticket items can really help people imagine what can be different. And finally, the mayor of Bogota is taking a different approach. She wants her legacy to be about walking 
but she's doing it at a fine grain all across the city in all of the different different neighborhoods. She's not going for the big, big ribbon cutting moments. She's going for a web of great walkability across the city. So I've talked about some of the different things that actually really make a difference. And cities, it's actually just before I do, uh, let me see if I can go back. No, it's only going forwards. So what I wanted to say in summary, um, before I move off from cities, is the thing with the cities is you've got to look, it's very easy to think, oh, well, they've got a high density population, they've got a low population, they seem to be, the two opposite things seem to be the same excuse. And we look at cities like Barcelona and Vienna, and I'm not going to talk much about Vienna because Dieter's here to do that, and I don't want to steal my good friend's thunder and, uh, and story. But these are cities that are already great for walking. And so you think, well, hey, just sit back, relax, enjoy it, you know, but they don't, they keep pushing. They keep stretching and looking at new ways that they can make their cities better. And Vienna invested heavily in walking and the relationships with public transport. Barcelona, the super blocks, extraordinary, fantastic. They don't, they can't change their urban fabric. They have what they have, but they can identify better ways of using it, reallocating space, creating green space. We did a survey with them in 2009. And the thing that people in Barcelona wanted more than anything to improve their walk was green space. They don't need any more cafes, which is what other cities want, but Barcelona wanted green space. And this mayor is investing in reallocating the public space that is their streets into green space and access for everybody in that city. So there's never a point at which you go, right, we're done. Albeit Oslo can definitely take a moment to rest on its laurels around so it's safety, but you have to sustain these things. So thinking about those bones, those bones like Barcelona or whatever, what are the features, the foundation for Ljubljana for being a great walkable city? I've given you a list here. Now, some of these things are very big, like a solid public transport network. Some of these things are quite small, like street lighting. And I did debate whether I put all of these different scale things into this list, but our experiences are all different. So if your experience is that actually it's really good street lighting, because for women, that's critical for feeling safe for going out um, after dark. If that's the thing that really makes a difference, Share that with me. It's so if we can just quickly run this poll. Yeah, the poll is active. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll see the answers, but uh, okay. never mind. You'll have them, and maybe we can uh, we share can it talk at about. The yeah, we can maybe we can talk about them in the discussion. Yeah, yeah, great, great, because there is no single thing with with this type of of um, with walking or with answers. I mean, bicycles in some ways have so much. They have it so much harder because they're taking. You know, they're managing a gap a space between people and cars, but they also have a very clear thing that they need, which is protected bicycle lanes. So walking is, is always more complicated, which of course makes it quite fun. So I want to reflect on last year. This is the 17th of March, 2020 in, uh, in your lovely city. And this is what COVID did to most cities all over the world. We suddenly had empty streetscapes. We had people walking around, very little traffic movement, very little human movement for quite um, a period of time. And what a shock it was, but what an opportunity it was as well. And so for those short times that we were allowed out every day, we saw people coming out and occupying the space that was now available to them. And the thing was that pandemic or otherwise, people do still need to access their local streets for shopping and for exercise. This image in Kampala, they were actually told by national government, you must go out, the, he closed these major roads, please go out and exercise. And he, they were encouraged to, to do so. And so all over the world, we saw the streets empty of vehicles and not fill so much with pedestrians because we were still trying to social distance or be at Bogota and Kampala here look quite busy but people still need their local streets. And that need didn't change whether there is a pandemic or there isn't a pandemic. Our local streets need to enable people to walk. And as we evolve and move out of this pandemic, we uh, uh, during last year, in the bottom picture, you can see the picture of Cheltenham. This is my hometown. This is my local high street. This is not one of these big global cities. This is just a little small town in England. And even here, they had to put up barriers to put more space for people to walk and cycle in that space. And so the question everyone has asked as a result of this is, 
what can we learn and how can things be be different? Well, Milan was ready. They had their plans, they had their ambitions, they got the paint out, they painted it, and they um, enabled people to walk and cycle and they reallocated space immediately following the pandemic. London took their car free plans and rolled them out. In the city of London, they've had these plans for 20 years. We know because we've been working with them on this long, but they took the political imperative and motivation that comes with COVID and that opportunity. Now, it didn't work everywhere in London. There's been a lot of pushback in South London and this road closed boxes that you can see at the bottom. Delivery drivers literally drove them down and pushed them out of the way. There's been a lot of kickback. But if you get past that moment, the research shows you get past that first six weeks when the loud voices of the motorized lobby shouting, shouting, and you go back into those communities and say, do you like a light traffic neighborhood? How is it for you? They get a resounding support from people in that neighborhood. And even in cities like Nairobi, now this is what's really interesting with COVID. Nairobi's had a commitment in its budget of spending 20% on walking and cycling for a number of years now, but they haven't instigated it. So th there's the policy and then there's the action. And this is the governance issue that I really wanna raise. But come the pandemic, they had that policy lever ready and they got a new guy in to look after things and he turned it on. He said, right, we have to do something different. And he's now using that to invest in walking and cycling in the CBD and now rolling that out into, into other neighborhoods as well. So even if sometimes if you're sitting there going, oh, the city never gets around to these plans, there's these moments when we can take action in response to what's happening, but we must embed it. And that's what I wanna spend the last little bit of my time talking about is how do we embed this in our systems and in our processes and in our governance so that they're not just a flash in the pan and we don't have to wait for the next pandemic to, to get the next significant um, change. Because this is with us now. We don't know whether we're ever going to operate in our public spaces and move in our cities the same as we did before. Something will always be different. For those that remember, you know, before 9-11, we never had the levels of security, but we still fly. We just change the way we manage ourselves around the airline industry. And I see that there's going to be changes, but we have to make sure that they're constructive because public transport is bleeding passengers at the moment because from a false perception, that it's a, a risky place for the pandemic. So I wanna just quickly run through and I'm just gonna mention these so that you understand them. This is a two day workshop we normally run with cities about eight steps to walkable cities to really embed good governance. And we've drawn this from our work with cities all over the world and from the research about the pieces that you have to put in place, the stepping stones. And they aren't automatically chronological because sometimes people have already have invested or they've done some research or whatever, but these are the elements that come together to enable cities to really deliver for walkability. Commitment, political commitment. And uh, I'm very pleased to have been able to put this picture on the screen. And it doesn't matter sometimes whether a city has a current mayor. I mean, we've had various mayors of London sign the International Charter for Walking, but this was in 2016. And that single step up to make a commitment, to make a public statement that you're interested and invested in walking, that top-down vision, prioritizes actions within administrations, but it's not enough to just say it as we know. So there's a number of things which we think are really critical. You must understand the walking activity in your city and what people think about it. Understand what motivates them, what barriers they face, how much they walk, where they go, where the opportunities are to actually connect with people already walking, reward them for walking with good conditions, and also address the barriers or lack of motivation that they face. Understand your environment, but understand your environment from the perspective of involving the community in mapping the weaknesses. Now, this is in Lagos in um, Nigeria. We've got a, this tool, this stride tool. It's an app where people can go out and measure the environment and say, this is where I feel safe. This is where I feel uncomfortable. And they're not a technical analysis, an audit and a technical analysis is for experts. This is a community experience about what they do and don't like and where they can't walk to a train station because the traffic is so bad or access a local hospital. And then the experts go out and assess the environment, raise the value of walking, have proper audit tools, understand what the different elements are, what matters, and what the potential solutions 
are as well. And that's your job as professionals. The community can tell you what they want. Like they say, we want to be able to cross the road, but it's not for them to decide which version of crossing is installed. And that's the, that's the combination. You can't do all of that assessment of the environment without looking at the paperwork, at the regulations, at the, at the background sort of policies. There's no point wanting to lower the speed if you don't have a, a legislative mechanism for it. There's no point um, waiting for pedestrian warrants to put in a crossing because it's, you're, not got, you're gonna wait forever. You can have policies that say outside every school, we have a safe crossing, but you must review all of these frameworks because with respect to traffic engineers, if there's a way that they can get out of providing things that might put extra costs into their project, they'll wiggle through those loopholes. I've seen it too many times. If it's And so you must have this set of design standards, expectations and regulations in place. Of course, an action plan. Now a plan is only a process. Everyone thinks, right, we've done a plan. Whew. This is not a plan. This is not an action plan. The doing of the plan, the creating it, the engaging all the different stakeholders, bringing in the street lighting people, bringing in the traffic police, bringing in the tourism industry, bringing in all your different stakeholders, engaging ownership, commitment to the ideas, the process of doing that creates then and the investment plan to actually go and do it. Because planning is everything, but the plan is actually irrelevant unless you act on it subsequently. Following the planning, of course, you must go out and do something and do something significant. Like this is again, the Seoul project. It's big, it's significant. Like the triple bridges, it was significant. It helps people imagine what can be different. It doesn't have to be at this scale. You could take a local neighborhood and do all of the streets around a school and make them not just okay for walking, or, but make them really good for walking and then measure the impact. Please, please, please evaluate, measure learn lessons and then come and share them at Walk 21 because so often walking projects don't get evaluated, budgets run out, interest fades. And if we can prove the benefits and the gain that comes from this, that gives us knowledge and confidence to continue down this path. And finally, of course, then get those commitments, those investments to continue doing what works for walking and target those investments for best effect. And so we're big fans of commuter catchments around public transport so people can get to public transport. If you invite them to walk to public transport, it's all part of the offer rather than the, the attraction, like right outside their front door, there's their lovely comfy car with air and sound and a cushy seat. If you can get them past that in a pleasant walk to the bus stop, then you're winning them already and, and getting them involved in their local communities. And so we see these eight steps have been really successful in bedding down walkability into cities. London has a set of design standards. Every time they do a road, these design standards inform what's done now and makes it better for, for walking. So just quickly, I wanted to talk about the stride tool, which I mentioned we used in Lagos in Nigeria, because we're very committed to a people-centered approach. And it is really important to understand what the community wants. And we worked in Medellin in Colombia with children. These children live in a poor part of town. So the government pays absolutely no attention to them whatsoever. They have no value in the broader scheme of things until they said, we are really tired of feeling unsafe and unhappy about walking to school and the road safety stats were appalling. And there's a local pedestrian association called Funda Piaton. And we got some funding from Alstom to work with them and to map, as you can see in the middle there, the red is where they feel unsafe and unhappy and the green is what they like. And that project and a little bit of international attention and that level of engagement, the government came and built all 10 interventions that they, that they identified, improved the road safety in the area, improved the quality of the experience and inspired them to start lobbying for a national walking strategy. So you can really grow upwards from the community. And we're taking this now to Dublin. I come back to Dublin. We are hopefully going to be in Dublin for our conference in uh, 2022. If we can meet in person, this will be lovely. But there's some really important elements about why I'm particularly talking about Dublin apart from that, um, because we are working with them on a number of fronts. We've talked already about the national investment in walking. They're also writing a national strategy. They're hosting us and they've got that agenda working across lots of different towns and investment. In Dublin, we're doing a project with them, looking at the experience of women because women are not using their tram system 
because of the walkability of the neighborhoods and the discomfort they have accessing that. So we are looking into the project again with the Stride tool and with the Alston Foundation to understand that experience. And why are we doing women? Why are women special? Because well, we're not a special interest group. We are actually half the population. And how we move and how we uh, make choices about how we travel by ourselves and with our children is different. It is different from men. It's not better or worse, it's just different and it needs to be recognized and attended to because then it enables women to feel more confident and safe in their communities and to access their transport services. And just in September, Rachel Carhill released the report, Travelling in Women's Shoes, which looks at women and transport in Ireland. But the gender studies are coming out everywhere now, the experience of women in transport. And someone actually even said, if you do nothing else in the transport system, but make it better for women, this is one of those paradigm shifts. This is not a threat. This is not a special interest group. This is not making it worse for men. This is just addressing the needs of the different people who, who need it. So I do invite you to Dublin. Let's hope we can meet in person. But I think Ireland is the place to watch right now. They're really investing and interesting. And that brings me back to the center of your lovely city to, to finish. And just to remember that it, it's up to us. It's our choice. We are the lucky people. We can choose to walk. We can then choose to invest in walking. But, and we can, we can have the right to enjoy it. And this little girl has the right to enjoy that walk. And we as professionals have the right to make a difference how we can by by prioritizing walking for our communities. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It's been a joy to be back in Ljubljana, even if it's only in my, in my head, and I look forward to questions and the discussion. Yeah, uh, we have some time for questions. And of course, there's a discussion at the end. You mentioned today's workshop. Is that one-on-one, -on -one, one city, one city, or more professional can join, more professionals can join at the same time? Yeah, so Just asking. Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> we do it with a city. So we've done it with Rotterdam and we've done it um, in, in Latin America, but we've actually also done it as a regional workshop in, in Asia. And we've done it in um, Berlin with a number of different groups coming together to learn the method. Yes. So it depends. Yeah, I keep, for yeah. Put it I keep forgetting these were probably live workshops, not online. And that has changed completely in the last year. Um, I can hardly imagine putting walking on the political agenda, at least in Slovenia, I can't imagine being a topic uh, before the elections. Uh, but as you say, we should start uh, putting it on the agenda. So any ideas there? What should we do? Because you, you basically say we should start doing something about it. Yeah, well, you have, you, you have put it on the agenda. You do already have a really, I think I'm interested in that foundation's question, if there's any way we can share that again from the poll. But the things that I see in, in Ljubljana is that you have put it on the agenda. You did the good things first, downtown, mm -hmm. old town, waterfronts, but you have a public transport system. You've got, I mean, on the outskirts of where I was, yes, it's a big, you know, motorized sort of city, but there are wider sidewalks. In some places there are street trees, it is there already, but the relationship with public transport, if your public transport operators want to recover from the pandemic as strongly as they should, they're going to need, need walking. And women are on your side for this as well, because in fact, more women walk um, than men, and they choose to walk in terms of the ch children's mobility, and the research shows that in terms of a climate agenda, um, concerns about those, uh, those global issues, um, motivate women more to actually make different choices. And that's globally, actually, where the, whichever country you're looking at, this is, this is a pattern. So there's plenty of opportunities. I mean, this year we've got COP in Glasgow and the countries nationally, not just in Ljubljana, but they have to have nationally determined contributions about how they're going to address climate change. So transport is very poorly represented. So if anyone here is from national government and has an opportunity to use that lever, then that this year is the time for that because that's they're under the gun in terms of having to contribute and legally are required to make this contribution. Locally, go for economic vibrancy, community cohesion, use children. What politician doesn't want to kiss a baby? You know, and making the cities nicer for walk is better for babies and young people. 
Yeah, and as you say, you must go out and do something. And Marco, who is also a speaker later on, says that women are in fact more than half of the population when it comes to walking. And data from Ljubljana shows that two thirds of walkers are women. So this is really, this is normal, right? This is not too it's different. Very, from... It's very typical of most cities that it's okay. women. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Brahman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, people will be able to ask you questions in the discussions uh, at 1 p.m. So uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can meet in person and walk through uh, the city of Ljubljana.